have those experiences that somehow transport us back to a place and time in our not so recent past. And I feel like at Christmas time, especially, it can be something completely un unexpected, something completely out of the blue, and all of a sudden, you are somewhere else entirely. And for me, it tends to be a, a piece of music or a smell or something, and instantly I'm transported back to my decorated living room in Key West. Uh, this time around, that was me listening to Amy Grant's Home for Christmas. That came out in 1992. It was a hit from the start in our house, and it was just played on repeat. And though I can now sing most of the words of every song because I have continued to listen to it over and over, there's one particular song that I can't help but listen to every year, and that is with this beautiful, eerie opening. This piano piece starts going. Breath of Heaven starts with Mary near birth, wondering the very things that she pondered on the day that the angel of the Lord came to visit her. She sings, and I wonder what I've done. Holy Father, you have come and chosen me now to carry your son. And as the song builds in its soaring chorus, it, all, it not only touches my heart for the melody, but it touches my heart for the realness of what happens in this space where she learns that she is not only favored, but she will be carrying this most sacred baby. It's a song of comfort, and it's a song of faith, but it also gets to the heart of the real, lived human experience. It's a song that reminds us that Mary was walking into the unknown. She's uncomfortable. She's nervous. She's like every new parent awaiting the birth of their child, unsure of what is to come. But she knows that she's walking a path that is uncharted. A path that no one before her has walked because no one before her has been called to such a role as this. It's a song of deep human desire for God to be near. Or maybe each Christmas year you're actually choosing a different Mary song. You're, you're one of the folks who really loves Mary Did You Know. And there's a lot of different versions that you can sing of this. You can choose the Pentatonics or Kelly Clarkson or Carrie Underwood. I myself am partial to the Dolly Parton version because she throws an extra line into the song. In her trademark song, Dolly Speaks Sing Style, Mary, if you knew how wonderful for you that he'd choose you to bring to us the King of Kings, God bless you, Mary. See, I like that version because it returns us to the origin of Mary's motherhood journey. It's a conversation for another day that I actually think that the song should be a Good Friday song. But it is a reflection for Mary on all of the things that Jesus will come and do in his life and ministry. And yet, in this reflection, Mary has known these things from the beginning. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will save our sons and daughters? Well, yes, she did know. But did her son do things out of her wildest expectation? Absolutely. Did she know that the extent of the love and admiration she would hold for her son would be as great as it was? I don't know if any of us know that before our children are born. But did she know that she was going to bear the King of Kings? Yes, because she was told exactly that. Surprisingly, we don't get a lot of songs about Mary during the Advent season. We get little snippets. A handful of our carols mention something about the mother, Mary, the virgin. But throughout the various popular Christmas carols and hymns, she's often put to the side. But we have the greatest of all Mary Christmas songs right here in the text for today. It's a song of pure joy and praise, a song of hope sung by a poor teenage girl that accepts a call of radical love that will change humanity for all eternity. Mary's song of praise that we've come to know as the Magnificat comes in response to a series of divine revelations. 
in preparation for the coming Lord. You've probably heard most of this story, but first it starts with Zechariah and Elizabeth, an old, barren, righteous couple, and they're visited by the angel Gabriel and told that they will have a son, John, who will make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And in Zechariah's disbelief, the angel silences his tongue until the day his son is born. But for his wife, Elizabeth, she looks upon her conception with reverence, holding close this gift and keeping it to herself for many months. And most of us know the next part of the story. The angel Gabriel visits a Galilean girl in the town of Nazareth, a virgin betrothed, yet not married, to a man named Joseph of the house of David. What we learn from these few pieces of information is that she is most likely young. She is most likely poor because Nazareth, and we hear this later on in John, is regarded as a lowly hamlet. It's a place where people don't necessarily want to go or stay when there are bigger cities around. And she is most likely at the mercy of her husband's family for all of her well-being. And... She is favored by God. Unlike Zechariah's question of disbelief at the coming of his son, Mary's confusion is that of astonishment and fear. How could I be favored? What did I do to become worthy of being in the presence of the Lord? And logically, how is it possible that she will bear a son, let alone the son of the Most High, the King of all generations, if she has not done the one thing required of baby making in the first place. And I think it's a fair question to be asked, especially by a teenager who is just trying to figure out how is this going to work? What I find remarkable though, is that it is Mary's relative Elizabeth that inspires Mary's declaration of willingness. It's in Elizabeth's miraculous pregnancy after years and years of being unable to bear a child, that Mary is awakened to the truth that nothing is impossible with God. Because Elizabeth, in bearing John, is already preparing the way of the Lord, which inspires Mary to accept her call to be the servant of the Lord. She says, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be me according to your word. In our Advent Wesleyan study, Almost Christmas, April Casperson writes that Mary's acceptance, her willingness to be used by God in light of the unknown, is an act of altogether love. And altogether love, it's a love that requires us to dive in without knowing all the details for another, knowing that there are risks involved. And I wonder if Mary thought of those risks. Consider the risk of childbirth and pregnancy today. How much more dangerous was it for women in her time, place, and station of life? Mary is saying yes to bearing a son, to breathe the name Jesus on her lips, but that doesn't necessarily come with a guarantee of her survival. And I wonder if, after her initial yes, her fear and anxiety got the best of her. If it was enough for her then to drive to the comfort of a relative's house, mm -hmm. to Elizabeth's house, to the support of a woman who gets it all. She's already bearing a baby. The physical toll of childbearing is on her, and she's pretty old, so especially on her. The shock of carrying a child she never anticipated the weight of following the command of God. While we experience radical love in Mary saying yes to God, we also witness the radical love of Elizabeth, who opens up her arms without judgment or skepticism and cries with joyful exclamation, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Folks, I want the radicalness of this scene to sink in. The author of Luke's gospel has made two women 
one old and barren, one young and poor, both marginalized just for the sex in which they were born, central to the story of the coming Messiah. Before Mary even utters a word of her song, the reader knows that something new is coming with this child, something that goes against the patriarchy, driven narrative of the time. Luke is inviting the reader to dare to dream the impossible alongside Elizabeth and Mary, to dream of the possibility that even Israel has longed and yearned for will come to pass. And so when Mary, in response to and emboldened by Elizabeth's words of blessing, opens her mouth to sing, it is a song of praise to the Lord. But it is also personal. It's personal because you see the hints of admiration for what the Lord has done for Mary and what the Lord is already doing in the world with the coming of this baby. My soul magnifies. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. All generations will call me blessed. He has done great things for me. Holy is his name. These are words that just highlight that praise. And it's personal. And it's something we can all draw upon as we consider how this blessing carries from generation to generation through the birth of Christ. It's praise, and it's personal, but it's also revolutionary. I wonder what you thought the first time you heard these words. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away. Some churches gloss over the Magnificat, leaving Mary as nothing more than a background character. She becomes a physical vessel with one purpose in a play that stars her own son. And every year, I go on to the artist formerly known as Twitter, and there are arguments breaking out over the literal, quoted words of the Magnificat. Words that are depicted in art by artists like Ben Wildflower or Laura James. You'll see these on the screen. Perhaps they even spark a bit of unease in you, because they are quite radical. But the fact is that Mary is not just the sanitized, glowing, virginal woman portrayed in countless pieces of art. She is the one who bore Jesus, the Savior of the world, who comes to dismantle all systems of oppression, to break every chain, to lift up the lowly and the lost. She is the woman who dreamed and sang of a day when oppressive governments would topple and the poor would be uplifted. What happens when we open up to all of scripture is that we are also confronted with the reality of a gospel that explicitly says the proud, the powerful, the ruling, the rich, all will be cast out from their places of privilege for those on the margins of society. The poor and the oppressed are at the center of Mary's song. These are the ones for whom God's blessing is bestowed. Maybe this song doesn't sound like good news for the rich. But imagine how this sounds to the poor and the oppressed. The hard truth for us in a place where Christians are living in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, in some of the most privileged spots in the nation, is maybe that we need to consider our role in the Christmas story. It's not to say that we do not live into God's blessing but it is a question of how we live into God's blessing with our privilege. What is our role in the Christmas story? Are we working to uplift the voices of those who have been silenced? Are we recognizing systems of oppression and figuring out ways to dismantle them? Are we feeding the hungry? Are we working to set the captives free? For a people who are called to love God and neighbor and who share in our love for God by loving our neighbor. A song of good news for our neighbors should be a song of good news for us. 
Mary's song should be a good news word for us. When we accept the Christmas narrative, we are also welcoming a new way of being. A way that turns everything on its head. This is the song that we should sing. This song of radical love that invites us all to dream like Mary dreamt. To be overjoyed as Mary and Elizabeth were overjoyed. And so today, on this final week of Advent, where we bring to near fullness the light of Advent, I, a pregnant woman, center the experiences of not just one, but two Middle Eastern pregnant women whose dreams are to bear God's true reality of love here on earth. They will be the ones to bleed, to labor, to embody the sacrifice of love and how they nurture, care for, grow and parent their beloved children. Great risk is involved in being a mother. And every time we dare to love our children unconditionally, we put ourselves at risk of pain and disappointment, heartache and grief. Great risk is involved when we dare to love the one child unconditionally. The child who comes to us as a wrinkly, pink, squalling baby by the Holy Spirit through a virgin birth for the least and the lowly of the world. Let's take the risk this Christmas to love radically, to dream and to pray for and to struggle for a world where peace reigns supreme, where the powerful who kill and murder innocent civilians are toppled, where the policies that keep many in poverty are dismantled, where no one feels alone, and where the Marys and Elizabeths of this world are considered sacred in body and soul. Let us carry that dream like a song into the full light of Christmas. May it be so in the name of God the Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. Every week in worship, we leave you with a few questions. Here are this week's questions for you. Go forward in the world knowing that we are called to a radical love, a love that broke through to all of us in the form of a baby, a love that is embodied by a woman who did not know what to expect and still said yes. Say yes this Christmas to loving in bold and new ways.